Hello, everyone. Uh, for the listeners, this is the one of our fir- this is the first episode in our interview series uh, by ISC titled "Gender Equitable Decarbonization." And in this episode, we are going to be talking about the demand and deployment of gender equitable decarbonization in with a global context. Um, in this episode, we aim to bring out a rich discussion on why organizations and nations alike should think uh, uh, for a gender equitable approach towards their decarbonization journeys and how this can be su- uh, successfully operationalized on ground. Um, for this, we have with us today uh, Leslie Johnston. Uh, Leslie, um, as a woman occupying a leadership role as the CEO of Laudes Foundation, which is globally renowned for their work on advocation for inclusivity and equity in climate action and beyond. Um, I believe that you possess a unique perspective on the scarcity of female leaders in this field and and otherwise uh, as well. Uh, Your position also gives you a profound understanding of the importance of having women um, uh, and having equal contributions from women uh, towards climate action, uh, just as men. Furthermore, uh, Laudis Foundation's work, your work in fashion and finance and built environment has been very instrumental in catalyzing systematic change to create economies which value equally people and nature as well. Now, and this aligns perfectly well with the, do- uh, with the topic of our today's, uh, today's episode, uh, gender equitable decarbonization and its deployment and demand. And I eagerly anticipate hearing your insights and your inputs on this matter. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and what an introduction. I'm very (laughs) humble and happy to be here. Uh, So maybe should I say a few words about Loudest Foundation? Yes. Um, To maybe set the scene. So Loudest Foundation is a bit of a new kid on the block. Uh, We actually just launched it in January 2020, very much focusing on how can we tackle what we call the dual crisis of climate and inequality. And we're doing that through business, industry, and finance. We've identified specific industries where we find that there's an outsized impact, negative impact on both climate and social equity. And we're using business as a tool to essentially address that in a good way, effectively harnessing what we say is the ability of business to use its power for good. So that, that's loudest, and because we work in industries such as the fashion industry, we're very active in countries like India and Bangladesh and do a lot of work both on the labor rights side of the social equity as well as on the climate side around our work with agriculture. Perfect. Um, so uh, 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 with the climate action work and the social equity work at Blodis Foundation, we are seeing at the moment there is um, magnitude of action towards climate action and decarbonization by organizations, by nations, and uh, globally we have committed to certain targets for our our climate action. So as we are establishing these new systems, these new technology systems or moving towards decarbonization, um, decarbonization, sorry, in your opinion, do you think that we should leverage this decarbonization journey as a platform for building more gender equitable societies or integrating gender uh, equity within the societies as we establish uh, these decarbonized systems? Absolutely. And I think that, I mean, there's a reason why we use the word crisis when we frame sort of what we stand for as loudest. I mean, we are in a crisis situation which calls for urgent, brave, and bold action by business, by policymakers, by workers, producers, communities, by investors. And that's an opportunity. Um, I think there's actually a really interesting opportunity probably in maybe three different areas where we can really leverage this push on decarbonization in the name of gender gender equity. Um, And one area is around essentially the rules of the system. You know, we are in a situation right now where rules are being written and sometimes rewritten. Um, You saw that you know, in the aftermath of COVID, where everyone was talking about building back better, and you're seeing that now with the IRA in the US and the European side, the, the Green Deal. It's a very exciting time because the bar is being raised on climate action and being en- enshrined in policy. Um, and that's an opportunity to actually also enshrine the social equity side. 
that doesn't always happen. I think sometimes, and you see this with the EU and the way it's structured, sometimes you have your environmental people over here and your social people over here, <laughs> but we're really talking about the nexus of this issue um, and they do need to come together. So policy is a great way to bring um, social equity, gender equity um, into the equation. I think the other way we can do that is through incentives. And this is where work in finance is really important because effectively, if you can move money through the system in a certain way, you can drive the real economy. And by actually creating parameters and incentives by investors to businesses, that if they were to get you know, a loan or an investment, they have to meet certain thresholds, both social and environmental, that not only accelerates the business action to do that, but also puts gender equity on the agenda. So we find that investors, um, both uh, banks and institutional investors, can be very effective leaders for change. Um, and maybe the third thing, and this is probably the most important um, and goes to the core of what we mean when we talk about equity, um, you can't actually have decarbonization without bringing in gender equity, because otherwise you're going to have a very sad world. I mean, the world, we can decarbonize, we can decarbonize with technology, but if we don't do it in a way that is consultative, collaborative, and in partnership with those vulnerable, marginalized communities that have the most to lose or gain and are part and should be part of the solution, then it's not going to be a world that I would want to live in, nor would I put that on my kids. So that element is really important. Um, and when we started Loudest, we always talked about this crisis of climate and inequality. Um, but what's key to that is to get to, in, to get to equality, you need equity. And that's where, you know, the work that we're doing, trying to understand, okay, how do you bring more equity in? You know, what is it, what are the institutional barriers that make it difficult for a woman um, or you know, someone with a disability or someone from, you know, a marginalized community, um, a certain caste, for example, what prevents them from participating fully in the economy? I think that's, that's a very important point. Uh, I think that's a very important point where you talked about equality and equity, where equality should be used as a foundation to then move on to equity because equality in itself is not enough considering the marginalized populations, considering uh, historically marginalized people, women or people with disabilities who have not been able to enter the mainstream workforce. Um, I think just saying that equality is going to solve the problem is not enough. So that's actually a very important point. Um, yes. Yeah, um, and it's, or maybe if I can just build on that, because it's, it's taken us a while, okay, we're only three years old, but it's taken us a while to land on that. <laughs> Because we started with equality, and equality is where we want the world to end up. Uh, but that doesn't bring in, you know, the lens not only of gender, you know. So there's a gender justice element, but there's a, there's an intersectional lens that we need to bring, and we need to understand all these identities, which actually create barriers to access. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, I think any climate solution, any decarbonization. It can't just do no harm to those communities impacted. It has to bring them along and be part of the solution. And if you're going to bring a community along, you need to understand them. And that's where like understanding all those different identities and lenses becomes really important. And I can give some examples on our work and, and how we're doing that. But that's that's really the core of, of our what we call our gender equity and social inclusion work. Right. Um, so if we if we talk about gender equity, social inclusion, uh, uh, studies have specifically shown that gender equity is not just a mere uh, social obligation. That uh, that that's not that should not be the reason of us thinking about increasing gender equity. That should not be the only reason. It's because there's a lot of other benefits or cool benefits that come with bringing in gender equity or equity um, in general into organizations or, or on a country, country level or a national level as well. Um, so far, there hasn't been so much focus on integration of gender equity as much in equality policies and action. But from your experience, from your work at Laude's Foundation, what are some of the benefits that, that just like, you know, uh, scream out at us when we think of integrating gender equity into the decarbonization journey or think of social inclusion and actually including everybody um, into the workforce and into the economy to be able to contribute equally? Yeah, well, I love this question because um... The answer should be obvious, shouldn't it? It should include the other half of the population in, in, in the work that we're doing and make them part of the solution. But it, it's not obvious because it's hard. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's really hard to understand, 
you know, what is the business case of bringing that lens in because it takes longer and it's that whole thing like alone I go far, far but together we go further that sort of thing. So, you know, from my perspective, I, I let me use an example from our work in finance area um, hmm. and because that's one that I think finance is such an interesting lever for change and really trying to accelerate decarbonization. And we recently supported a working group that was set up by Gender Smart, um, and that was called the uh, it's called the Gender and Climate uh, Working Group, very well named. But the idea was to really try to understand what is that nexus of climate action mm-hmm. that comes from the investor community and gender. And how can we better understand that? And, and what that group found is that there are real benefits to bringing a gender lens into how you invest. And first and foremost, it helps you manage risk. You know, that's kind of an obvious one. And investors also like to you know manage risk and be on top of that. Um, it also helps you sort of fulfill what we would say is your fiduciary duty as an investor uh, because you're having a a bigger impact um, on the community um, and ultimately, hopefully, driving longer term value. Um, There's a creativity that comes with bringing a gender lens. You're bringing parts of the population that maybe haven't been part of the solution and they can come up with different innovations and approaches, Um, you know, so you can actually really get a a mushrooming of solutions um, because you have this diversity of opinion coming in. Um, You can find, as a result of that, you know, new investment opportunities. And we've seen that. And you see this on boards when you have more women on boards or women running businesses. You're getting better performance, uh, you know, with with the businesses or the boards. Um, Same thing on the investor side. So the list goes on and on. But I think, you know, there's data that backs us up. And I think ultimately, um, if we're serious about climate, we have to be serious about equity and equality and make sure all those voices are part of that solution. Um, And when we talk about these benefits, some are obvious, some are not obvious, and as you said, it's a very nuanced and a complicated issue. Um, I think it also uh, changes for whether we are talking about a developed nation like maybe the UK or the US or Europe, and when we talk about emerging nations like uh, Bangladesh, India, etc. So uh, how, how do you see it um, playing out for, uh, how do you see the benefits of gender equity integration into decarbonization journeys playing out for the emerging nations? That's a big question. <laughs> I'll, let me narrow that question because I'll focus on the area that we're working in, which is the fashion industry. Yes. And, you know, and if you look at the fashion industry in, say, India, um, and look at kind of the makeup of those that participate in that industry, whether it's garment workers or producers, you know, farmers, um, it's mostly female. And this is where, um, well, majority female, I think some countries have more more percentage women than, than India does. Um, and this is the perfect example that if you were to decarbonize the fashion industry, The first thing you would do if you are a brand and retailer, well, first of all, you look at your supply chain and try to understand your scope three uh, impact and how you reduce that. But you might also seriously think about reshoring because there's a lot of carbon in producing far, far away if you're a European producer. So there is a real threat of significant job loss for people, mostly women, who may be the breadwinner in their family um, because of decarbonization. And so we want to avoid, obviously, that unintended consequence, um, but it is a reality. I mean, we're seeing brands already starting to, to reshore. Um, so if you look at you know the case of India, I think the, the solutions here to bring gender equity hand in hand with decarbonization really mean changing or even transforming the business model behind these these value chains. So for example, we need to shift from what was really a single fiber, you know, cotton farmer supplies the gin, which eventually goes into your t-shirt to looking at how producers farm on their land, taking more of a regenerative landscape approach understanding the resilience of the farmers, understanding the sensitivities and vulnerabilities they have, and supporting them in both diversifying their revenues, the crops that they farm, and the access to markets. And that's exactly what we're doing in Madhya Pradesh in India with mostly women, vulnerable women farmers, and helping them understand not only how to diversify and make their income streams more resilient, but also being creative around how do you bring in different types of income? You know, if you're starting 
to build regenerative landscape, then you have opportunities for monetizing carbon. And you can start looking at ways to bring insetting into uh, your farming and sell that to brands and retailers who would very willingly pay for that because they need that as part of their own strategies. So there's creative solutions around that, which we're testing. Uh, but I would say that in sort of, you know, economies like India, there is a lot of untapped opportunity to bring the decarbonization and the gender equity together. I mean, we are at the very beginning of our journey and we're testing different models, but I would love to, to we'll learn from you and learn from others you're bringing on to this podcast, you know, what's working and what can we learn from yes. that? Yes, I think that's again a very important point, which is to know what's working and what's not, because everything is, is in so much infancy right now, there's going to be a lot of hit and trial. But the thing is that we have to keep hitting and trying until we get to that perfect optimized solution um and um so when, when when again gender equitable decarbonization or integration of gender equity into the decarbonization journeys when it comes to mind um we just talked about uh, uh, the fact that there's there'll have to be a lot of hit and trial they there's not going to be just one way there's going to be many ways there's going to be optimized ways there's going to be ways which are not as good but uh, again in your opinion uh if we are building an actual framework for gender equitable decarbonization and if you're looking at some of the immediate steps that countries can take or even on a micro level that organizations or companies can take um what are some of the low hanging fruits things that you know we can immediately start on so that we can start unleashing this change Yes, I'm not sure how low these fruits are hanging because it's a tough, tough thing to do. Um, but I think there is there is maybe one low hanging fruit that maybe doesn't come naturally to businesses, which is first and foremost, make sure that you bring those with lived experience into the decision making, because you know there's a saying that I think actually came from the disability movement, which is about it's nothing about us without us, which I love. Mm-hmm. because you know that all that that is all around you know if you want a solution to a problem we'll bring those that are most impacted by this along and be part of crafting that solution so so that's really critical and we don't see that happening enough um but i think also the other thing that's really important i think in terms of low hanging fruits is you need to make sure that the right got the protections are in place for workers for producers um to support them um in their roles and this could be you know this is just good business i mean it could be employer insurance if there is you know a horrible accident uh but it could also be you know again should be hygiene factors anti harassment anti discrimination these types of things they're critical to really create you know that safety and that surety for workers because things are going to get a lot harder and i feel that sometimes the basics aren't in place and we see that across multiple industries um and you know there's more work one can do around that um and maybe the 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 third thing is i would want to make sure that when solutions are being crafted that okay this goes beyond the nothing about us without us but that they can even be led by those that really have a big stake in this and 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 this is not an indian example but it's an example that we're testing in europe that i hope could actually be extended um there's a big issue around buildings um and when i decarbonize a building um and there's urgency to do that um it's really hard to do that and still keep in mind the social equity issues around that building um so we actually just have it's a new partnership but we partner with an organization called the shift which is actually bringing the voice of tenant associations and these are associations mostly of marginalized communities um you know that have different elements that have made it difficult for them to really engage and be a decision maker and make sure that they are at the forefront in how do you actually do this with social housing and decarbonize in a way that's fair and just to all um so it's just an example because it's a different um you know business model for how you decarbonize a very large asset class mm-hmm. <laughs> that's very expensive and that usually results in increased rent um and <laughs> Well, wow. you're a single parent and your rent increases and you're taking care of the kids and you're working three jobs, it's really hard to stay in that building. You know, so I think there's there's lessons from that that maybe we can look at, you know, in other geographies um as that decarbonization um imperative increases. Um so 
uh, looking at some of the um, uh, recommendations that you gave, or in your opinion, what would some of the low-hanging fruits be? It, it's very clear that uh, if we want this integration or amalgamation, amalgamation of gender equity and our clean technology deployment or green, um, uh, green sustainable development, it, it's something that would require a holistic approach, which means that a lot of stakeholders from different sectors, stakeholders from different areas of expertise will have to come together like climate experts will have to understand uh, gender experts gender experts will have to understand climate experts we'll have to understand the social settings we'll have to understand the uh, technology innovation so it's it's a very nuanced issue so it requires a very diverse uh, stakeholders coming together and then deciding on what the next step should be and also them having to work together in harmony or synchronization for it. So um, if we apply the Pareto principle and if we um, want to know who are the 20% of stakeholders who can create that 80% impact that we want to see in the operationalization of this gender equity, um, who do you think those stakeholders are? Like you said before that you, you, you think finance will play a very important role in it or policy will play a very important role in it. So who are those 20% or the critical stakeholders that need to come together so that we, we can have some huge impact in this direction? There's a lot. <laughs> so <I trust> you, <laughs> the, more than 20%. But I think you want to combine those that have the power to craft the rules with those that have the power to move the economy with those that have the, the most to lose or gain. And so I think it's this triad of investors, government, and the movements and communities that represent the workers, the producers, the, the communities, the families. And that's, I think, the critical element. Business will also come along and business, of course, plays a really critical role. But if you're looking at what's going to move the economy and the way things are designed, you need to get at the, the investors. Now, if you're looking at uh, you know certain certain geographies in the fashion industry, a lot of the industry tends to be owned by a small number of families, and that actually makes it very interesting. You know, when you're looking at who are the investors or the owners of these businesses, um, because then you have maybe even more ability to leverage that kind of family network uh, and influence there. Um, but that, those are the three. Now, the government one is always challenging because there's government on multiple levels. Uh, we find in Europe that it's very effective to actually work through the city level, um, because if you work at a city level, then you have the mayor and the municipality and you have more ability to maneuver. And that's why you see initiatives like you know, the Donut Economics Action Lab has really taken a city lens to how do they transform these, these societies. Um, that may be applicable in other geographies, um, but you know I think the national level and the, the international level of government um, is also critically important, but takes time. Um, and this is why, you know, if you're new policymakers in the room, and you were talking about India, I'd start with the state. And already, you know, in Madhya Pradesh, we've been doing a lot of work with farmers there for years, and previously with CNA Foundation, and um, found that the, you know, the state governments has been a real champion for the regenerative agriculture work that we've been doing. Well, this has been a great discussion. My perspective has widened. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm you glad you could make it to the podcast. Uh, I'm so happy you were able to share about your work. Um, well, thank you. Great. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>